And then okay, I'll let you do it. Okay, I'm recording. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so uh, so for all students here, um, we have a change of program a little bit. Uh, uh, Dr. Christina Savin, for some reason, perhaps there's some personal emergency, uh, did not make to the uh, talk. Um, so in the last minute, Rava, uh, uh, professor, is one of our organizers, uh, is gracious agree to fill in, uh, to give a talk. So, so, we'll, so we'll have a, a Rava to give a talk instead of Krishna Savin. And, uh, and we'll go on as we scheduled, um, about 45 minutes. And then uh, we'll take 10 minutes break, another 45 minutes and question and answers. And, uh, I'll, watch, I'll be watching chat room. So if you have any questions, uh, during a, a lecture, um, uh, please send it there and I'll decide whether to interrupt Rama. We'll wait until uh, we have a break and you also have a time, chance to, uh, uh, to talk about, to ask your questions. Um, and uh, so I'm going to save my introduction for Rafa's background uh, for, uh, for the next um, lecture because we're running a few minutes late. So, yeah, yeah, so I'll no, run, yeah. ask Rafa yeah. to begin. So yeah, Rafa, why don't you I don't need the, for, Sure, I don't need an introduction. Stepping. So let me, for let, let me uh, share my screen. So before I share my screen, I will uh, follow whatever guideline uh, Xiao Qing wants to give, but I was going to suggest that instead of maybe, I, I mean, whoever wants to ask in the chat, you should, but I was going to suggest to try that you guys just interrupt me. Um, since this talk is a little bit improvised anyways, um, the other thing is I've put together some amount of material. You have to forgive the fact that it's unpolished because I was basically preparing it during a lecture I was moderating. <laughs> And uh, you also, and there's also kind of a collection of material, maybe too long or too short, so you can stop me. And you know, if it, there's too much material, we we can just chat. You know, you can just ask me questions, and I'll try to answer. We don't have to stick to some uh, uh, strict uh, plan. So let me share my screen. So if anyone has a question during uh, Robert's talk, just uh, uh, just speak. Yeah, you can just interrupt and please don't hesitate to interrupt. Uh, let me see, why is this not? Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. And I see many of you have, um, so there are people in the waiting room, just to let you know, because I get these announcements also. Uh, uh, yeah, you I, know, so me and the TA will take care. Okay. and. Um, I see many of you guys have turned on your cameras. I'm very grateful like this, I can see you. And for those who are coming late, I see a couple of people who arrived after Xiaoqin. So unfortunately, um, Christina Savin has kind of vanished. I hope nothing has happened to her, but uh, she's not here. And uh, so I, I will fill in, in a somewhat improvised way. So I've put together a, a collection of uh, questions and that I would like to discuss a little bit with you, and but they all have to do with uh, representation of information by neurons. And this will cover uh, several different topics, but I would say that throughout one thing which is important is that we're talking about noisy neurons. If we had deterministic unit units, then things would be much simpler. And the fact that they're noisy is kind of at the heart of the problems we're going to visit. And so uh, the, the kind of setup that I have in mind is the kind of setup that we've, I mentioned during my introduction. And it's also the kind of setup that you could construct from, say, uh, um, Hang's talk a couple of hours ago where she had experiments where she would show a stimulus here, S, to some human subjects. And she would ask these human subjects to perform some action. So you're seeing some image, uh, some uh, circles, like in her example, and you have to point to a specific position in the circle. And um, the, the, the stimuli typically in these experiments are drawn from some distribution, which I call pi of, uh, of uh, S here. And, um, whoops, I lose my 
laser, sorry. Yes. So I, I call it pi of uh, S here. And then the action in the case of Heinz experiment, for example, was chosen by maximizing some utility. So you want to maximize the reward you get, or here I wrote minimizing some quantity. Forget about the details of the notation, but let's say minimizing the number of errors that you make. Okay. And so here, the central object that we want to focus on is this R, which is a representation, and I call it a random representation just because neurons are noisy. So I can always think of R as some kind of average response to a given stimulus plus some noise eta. Okay, and the fact that this noise eta is present is kind of making the whole problem uh, more, more uh, hairy. Now there's various, uh, there's a big range of questions one uh, may want to ask about, uh, about this kind of setup. And I don't know why, there we go. Um, and as I mentioned again in my introduction, the range of questions that one can ask is pretty broad. It goes from the mechanistic to the functional. So you can ask details about, you know, synapses that are involved in these mental representation or molecular details all the way to why such a representation is favorable to uh, an organism that will use it to achieve some tasks. In this talk, we're mostly going to focus on the last two kind of questions, namely how and why. Like why would we have such neural representations and kind of what kind of algorithms they allow you to have? What are the algorithms that allow you allow neurons to represent information? So these, these, this will be really the focus will be the algorithmic questions and the normative questions, the functional questions. So there will be two parts and I will divide them before and after the break. The first part concerns something that is very omnipresent in the brain, which is adaptation. So no unit, no set of neurons, not even the brain as a whole is operating at the same regime all the time. And so to say the regime of operation of the brain is constantly changing and one way to understand this uh, adaptation is through uh, a, a hypothesis or an approach of a mathematical approach called efficient coding, which has been illustrated already by uh, Zhao Ping and also by Hang. The model that Hang showed, her, the last model she showed in her lecture, was essentially an efficient coding model because it said that you want to represent probabilities but you want to use a limited range of resources to do so. And so the central idea in efficient coding is you want, is an idea of a trade-off. You want to encode information as accurately as possible, but without spending too many mental resources. And, and what exactly are mental resources is open for debate, and I will show you some suggestions, but the basic idea is an idea of trade-off. So this kind of occurs at many levels. One can apply this principle to understand neural systems at many levels, but I will show you first an example that is extremely classical that dates back from the 90s, but it's very, very beautiful. So I think it's very much worth knowing. And the other reason is that it concerns the very first neuron in, uh, in one of the sensory systems, namely the visual the retinal photoreceptors. So it's the very first neuron that converts light into neural uh, signaling. So as you know, you, the, the photoreceptors are in the retina, which is a tissue at the back of your eye. It's actually a piece of brain because as the embryo, the, 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 the brain is actually growing towards the eye. So it's not like some tissue that differentiates, but it's really a piece of the eye that comes in, a piece of the brain, sorry, that comes into your eye. And it's made of, roughly speaking, three layers of cells. And the first layer is photoreceptor, which is this, these cells that convert, that absorb light and convert it into a chemical signal. And this is done through a very complicated process, namely with the phototransduction kind of biochemical cascade, which involves a lot of molecules. You don't have to see all the details, but all what I want to emphasize here is that uh, 
it's a very complicated process. I'll say a bit more in a minute about it. But the main thing that I want to say here is that it, it results in a very adaptive behavior. So what do I mean by this? I mean that suppose that we give a flash of light and we measure the response of the photoreceptor. So for example, the membrane voltage of the photoreceptor. And now I give this flash of light superimposed on different backgrounds. So dim, for example, is I'm giving a flash of light during the night and I'm measuring the response. And bright is I'm giving a flash of light during, you know, in midday sun. So there's a lot of ambient light and I'm also measuring some response. And what you can see is that this response is changing depending on the background noise, uh, background light level. So at high, at, at low light level, the response is kind of slower and shallower and has only one peak. But at, in, in bright backgrounds, <clears throat> it's narrower, it's faster in time, and it has this double peak. So the whole shape of the response is changing. Another thing is that here, all these curves have been normalized to have the same amplitude. In reality, the amplitude is also changing by a huge amount. And it's, this is illustrated here. So here I'm, if you want, plotting the amplitude of this response to the same flash, but as a function of the background intensity. And so as I move to brighter and brighter light, the amplitude of my response goes down for the same stimulus. So basically, you're not seeing the real world because at the very first photoreceptor, you have this compression that is happening. And depending on the background, you have completely different responses. They change both in amplitude and in shape. Any questions? If you, you can int please interrupt me anytime you have a question. So now, <clears throat> What's an obvious way to ask, you know, how does this happen? Well, an obvious way is to go and look into the biophysics of photoreceptors. And I, one could do that, but I'm not going to spend much time on it. Again, I just want to emphasize that it involves many chemical species. All these symbols are one type of molecules. There are uh, channels that are present. There are active pumps that use ATP or just use electrostatic forces. And you can write differential equations for all these chemical reactions. There are all kinds of feedback loops. In addition, there are all kinds of biophysical processes. So why am I, I don't, I'm not showing this again to, for you to learn this. I'm showing this to show that there is a very complicated uh, uh, machinery that is active in the photoreceptor, but somewhat miraculously, you can explain at least some amount of the responses with a very simple model that we wrote a few years ago and it goes as follows so you, r here is the response of the photoreceptor and it's a function of the incoming light through these two filters so y and z here are filtered version of the the light intensity that impinges on the eye and alpha and beta are numerical uh, coefficients. Tau is also a numerical coefficient. So basically, you have just a simple uh, nearly linear equation. And you can think of it, you can rewrite it by dividing this term uh, on the left and the right. And you can think of it as light coming in, being convolved with two filters. And then one filter controls the time scale of the other filter, essentially. That's kind of a pictorial illustration. But what's nice is that unlike this complicated biochemical, um, biochemical um, uh, machinery, you can here analytically calculate some of the responses of the photoreceptor. And here I've given you what kind of response you get if you, if you give a flash input. So here you have the light intensity, some constant background, plus some peak, some delta function at time zero with some amplitude delta i. And you can, if you assume that this delta i is small, the amplitude of the flash is small, you can just plug this in and calculate what the response will be. And what you will find is that it will have two pieces. It will have a prefactor here, and it will have some a modified filter there. 
And basically the prefactor is telling you that it's going like one over I, so one over the background. And this is exactly this Weber law that I showed you before. And this um, uh, effective filter that depends on the background can explain the change of the shape of the filter, okay? So this simple model kind of is a nice, uh, at least pretty good approximation to the kind of responses um, that um, the photoreceptor gives. So this is not central to my lecture. And from now on, we will go to much more like statistical, algorithmic, or normative questions. The reason I wanted to show you this is that I think it's quite instructive to see that um, you can summarize sometimes a very complicated system that is governed by many coupled equations uh, with one simple phenomenological equation. And that's, I think, one of the roles of theoretical approaches in neuroscience is to kind of find these shortcuts or find these summaries that can help explain a complicated system and, and, and shed some light that enables you to think about it. But now the question that we want to address is like, why do we have this behavior? Why should the shape change? Why should I go from a monophasic filter in dark light to a biphasic filter in, in bright light? There should be some function, some advantage for the organism or for at least the metabolic expenditure. And so this problem was addressed in the, in the 90s by Van Hattern, who did a series of very beautiful uh, papers on this question, and he developed the first kind of nice incarnation of this efficient coding idea in the context of neuroscience. And it can be written a bit more generally than just for this uh, problem of photoreceptors. So I will write it slightly more generally, and then I will, will kind of specify it for the photoreceptor. So brace yourselves, because now there's a little bit of math. So I will consider some, a set of inputs, a sequence of inputs that I'll write S sub I, and a sequence of outputs of the cell. So the inputs are the light intensity, the output are the neural response, and I, I wrote it in this general fashion because you could think of I as being any kind of index. In our case, it will be time because we're interested in the output of a single cell and the stimulus will change over time. In general, it could also be space. It could be some different channels of information, okay? And the model that we will write for this photoreceptor is a linear model. It's a very simple linear model where we'll say, okay, the output at time I is some convolution of the input with this filter that I wrote phi sub ij. So that's kind of a temporal convolution. And I will assume also that there is some input noise. So that's, for example, the noise involved in absorption of light, for example, some noise at the entry. And then there is some output noise, okay, at the output of the cell. Uh, so I can also rewrite this in matrix notation since by you know, writing this as a vector, this as a vector and phi as a matrix, I can write it more simply like this. And to make things simple, although you will see it's not super simple, but it's quite simple still, I will assume that um, all the, the, the distributions are Gaussians and have vanishing mean. So I will assume that S the light input is distributed uh, in a Gaussian way with, uh, with some covariance matrix chi of S. And then I will assume that eta and gamma, which are the input and output noise, are also this Gaussian and are uncorrelated. So there they will have a diagonal covariance matrix. And I will call the element on the diagonal sigma sub eta and sigma sub gamma. Okay, so these yes. Uh, is the index i for time or is it a, a neuron index? No, so, I, okay, so in general you can, i could be a very general index and, and I'm now writing this completely generally and then you can apply okay. it to different problems and you're right okay. that in the problems that say attic and so on looked at, i becomes a neuron index and j a spatial index, in this example i will be time, okay? But thank you for the question. Yeah, that's an important. Yeah. So 
So now the, the proposal that Van Hatteren had, so this efficient coding proposal is to say, okay, I want to keep as much information about the input in my neural response. So I want to maximize the mutual information between R and S. I want my neuron to be such that its response will reveal as much as possible about the input. But now there is a simple way of doing this, if you think about it, is just to make this phi infinitely large. Because if you make this phi infinitely large, you make this gamma negligible, so you get rid of the noise, essentially. Okay? Now, this, of course, is not possible because neurons cannot have infinitely large responses. So how do we formalize the idea that neurons have a finite range of response? very similarly to the finite range of encoding that Hung had in her talk. Well, then we say you have to pay a cost if you want a bigger range of the response of your neuron. And we will say that this cost is the sum over time of the variance of the activity of the neuron. Okay? Now, this is a specific choice, and it was the choice that Van Hatteren did, but there's nothing that imposes this choice. You know, you could have the sum of the square root of this, or the sum of this at some power p, or even something completely different. But the point is that you have some amount of metabolic or energetic resources, and to use more of it will give you some cost. Alternatively, you could say, I, I can use that much and not more. So, this is one possible choice. Um, sorry to interrupt. I'm just something I've been I've been puzzled by before is this issue of um, taking costs as the um, as the mean square um, mean square response, particularly when it's um, a mean centered R. Are you assuming that the mean of R is is zero? Yes, I am. Yeah. So, so it's. Yeah. So zero R is not a quiet cell. It's a cell which is firing at some, at some average rate. Um, why would fluctuations around an average rate of firing be the cost? Okay, so, so let me give you two... On, on the one hand, you're absolutely right that this is an arbitrary definition of the cost. In other words, there is no... Um, mathematical argument that tells you if I want my cost to satisfy these axioms, then this must be the cost, like you would have for entropy, for example. So it's not imposed on you by a set of axioms. The reason, uh, besides the fact that it gives interesting results that you can then compare with data and so on, besides that, one way to think about it is to say, um, uh, that, okay, if I have a mean activity, that's the activity that the system is set up to have kind of as a base rate. So I'll not count that as an expenditure because that's there anyway. And I will count as an expenditure the energy that you have to furnish to move away from that. And the, the, the farther you move away, the bigger the energy expenditure. And so it's, it has to be something related to the variance. Now, it may not be the variance itself. It could be a power of the variance, which would also satisfy this requirement. Uh, um, so, mm -hmm. Sorry to press on, the, on this point, but why would reducing the firing rate down below the average rate be a cost rather than a saving? You would think metabolically that would be a saving, even if it's moving away from the norm. So th that is, th that's a, a very good question. And if you go back to this image, that's also why I kind of showed this. What you see here is that you have a very, very coupled system. So when you increase something, other things will decrease and uh, you have like all kinds of pathways that are coupled. And so I don't think you can ever simplistically think of, let's say I'm using more of that molecule because that molecule has to be synthesized by some other molecular engine, which itself will use some energy and so on. So the accounting of the energy itself is very difficult if you want to do it from a microscopic, from a biophysical basis. There are some people who tried to do it. Uh, and for example, there is a paper by, I think, Simon Laughlin and Srinivasan. There's also some work by Lenny and someone who tried to argue that the main expenditure is in spikes. 
and then calculated the electrostatic energy, basically, that the spikes will, or the ATP energy, I don't remember, that the spikes will cost, and you get to some function of the activity. Now, I don't remember if they got something that is like the square or like the variance or something like this, but those, even that calculation ignores a lot of other things that may be costly. So I think the biophysical, um, the biophysical basis is definitely something very interesting to think about and calculate. I don't think it's, it's been done in any very convincing way. But I think that just on, on phenomenological grounds, you could say, uh, well, I've, you know, I have some baseline activity and my system, suppose that I put my system at rest, it will naturally go to some kind of minimum energy state. If you assume that, then it means that somehow this whole coupled system is arranged in such a way that this steady activity is indeed some kind of ground state. And whether you move away from it up or down, you have to spend some energy. You see, I think that's the idea that is behind it. But I don't think there's any biophysical model that you could actually show that or, yeah. Is that Thank something? You. Yeah. Okay. So again, this is one choice. We'll see what it gives us. Okay, so now um, uh, brace yourselves, as I said. So we can rewrite this simply because it's such a simple linear system. I can rewrite this as the output given as some filtered input plus some big noise, okay, which will de depend also on the filter. And so what I want is to calculate now the mutual information between S and R, and you can just go that and do it by hand, but let me give you some intuition. Imagine that if S and R were one-dimensional quantities, then the mutual information is how many states of R can you distinguish from S, or vice versa, how many states of S can you distinguish from R? And so basically, if you have R that spans some region sigma sub R, and the noise in R is spanned by this noise in C, which is sigma sub C, then you can, you can have sigma sub R divided by sigma sub C different states. That's your resolution, if you want, in the system. And the mutual information is the log of that resolution. So in this case, now you can do this calculation for Gaussians and you'll obtain the same results, but I just give you the intuition of it. The intuition is if my noise has some, some thickness sigma C and my output has some range sigma sub R, then the mutual information is the log of this ratio, which is essentially the log of the number of states that I can recognize when I have some noise of that size. And now, in the general case, this generalizes quite uh, naturally to, instead of having a variance here, I will have the determinant of the covariance matrix. So in general, for a multivariate Gaussian distribution, the mutual information between two joint Gaussian variables that are higher dimensional than one will be proportional to the log of the ratio of the determinant of the output divided by the determinant of the covariance of the full noise, okay? So what we have to do basically is to calculate the determinant of these two covariance matrices. Once we do that, we have the mutual information and what I want to do ultimately to kind of apply this efficient coding principle is to minimize this Lagrangian or ma maximize, sorry, this free energy, which will be the mutual information on the left minus the cost, which is the, um, the variance uh, of my activity, of my output, okay? So as you can imagine, the way I do this is by diagonal, by finding a basis where these covariance matrices become diagonal. I can give you the slide, so I will skip this, the details here, but basically you find some rotation matrix S that will diagonalize um, you do your covariance matrices. And that's not hard to do because remember that I assume that the noise mat covariance matrices are already diagonal. So essentially, I just have to diagonal, diagonalize the covariance of the stimulus, psi s, chi s. Okay. 
So if I do that, then I can rewrite this uh, free energy as a sum of terms. And this, what does the sum of term involve? So it, the mutual information now takes this form. So what is C? C is just the, the filters, the matrix phi in that new basis that diagonalizes my uh, covariance of stimuli, okay? So C sub I is my filtering matrix, my, my temporal filter rearranged in the basis that diagonalizes my stimulus statistics, okay? What is now small d? Small d is ca capital D over sigma sub eta, and capital D is the eigenvalues of the diagonalized form of the covariance matrix of my stimuli, okay? So I have a set of stimuli at each time I have some stimulus, I can now diagonalize this, find a, 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 a basis where, uh, where, my, uh, where my covariance matrix of the stimuli will be diagonal. These capital Ds are the variances of the stimulus space. So D, capital, if capital D is large, it means that along this direction in stimulus space, I will have a lot of variation in my statistics. If capital D is small, if D2, for example, is small, it means that in the second direction, my stimulus is not changing a lot, okay? Um, and so in a sense, you can think of this small D as a signal to noise ratio in each of these diagonalizing di dimensions. So these are different direction in stimulus space and small D is the signal to noise ratio in that direction in stimulus space. Okay, so you can go through this again after, but I, th I think the, 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 the intuition is clear. Again, you take the, your stimulus space, you rotate it so that you diagonalize its covariance matrix, and then in each of the direction now, you, the noise is diagonal, the covariance is diagonal, so these different directions decouple. You can now look in each direction. In each direction, you have some amount of signal, which is given to you by this del D, capital D, some amount of noise, uh, input noise. Um, <clears throat> and in that direction, you have a filter, the magnitude of your filter, which is this C sub I, okay? So now here's the magic that happens, is that when you minimize this, you have very different solution solutions, depending on whether you're in a high or a low signal to noise ratio regime, okay? So if, you're, if your D is very, very small, so in the directions of your space, of your stimulus space, where the signal to noise ratio is very bad, is very small, to balance out these terms, what you will want, you can, exp so D now is very small. So if you imagine expanding this log, what you have is d squared times c, times c squared divided by c squared plus one. Here you just have c squared because d is small, you can neglect that. And so what you end up happening, uh, getting is that this c squared is proportional to d, okay? So what does that mean? That means that you will make a filter which is bigger if you have a bigger signal to noise ratio. In other words, if you have a lot of noise in your system, you will look at those directions in your stimulus space where the noise is not too large, and you will apply a big gain to those directions because the other directions are so noisy that you won't care about them. Okay, that's the idea here. Okay, and, and so you save on, on, on metabolic expenditure, on energy expenditure by ignoring essentially those directions that are very, very noisy, there's so much noise, it's drowning everything. You take the directions that have less noise and then you, um, you boost those, okay? Now you find a very different solution uh, for the case with um, uh, high signal to noise ratio case. So that's the case where D is much larger than one. And if you balance these two terms, what you find is that this C squared will go like, this C will go like one over D. So it's a completely different solution. So now it means that you're looking at given directions. They're all quite informative because the noise is kind of low in all of these directions. 
And what you will do is you will arrange the, 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 your gain to be inversely proportional to the signal to noise ratio. So that, in other words, you will use all these channels by the same amount. And that's the, the, the classical Shannon solution or histogram equalization solutions for those of you who are familiar with that. Uh, where you basically, this efficient coding principle tells you, I will use all my channels equally uh, with the same magnitude. That's whitening, basically. Okay. So in the high signal to noise ratio, you will want to whiten your signal. In the low signal to noise ratio, you just want to pick those directions that are very informative. Okay. So now how does this imply for our photoreceptor? So in the case of time, uh, <clears throat> the, the covariance in time is translationally invariant, which means that the, the eigenvalues of my covariance matrix are given by the Fourier power spectrum of my fluctuations of the input. Okay. And that we know uh, in natural statistics will decay like one over omega squared. Okay. So essentially, this is just, uh, if you want, another way to say it is that if I decompose my light input in Fourier modes, then my system will decouple. And that's because I'm translationally invariant in time. So let's see what, what this gives. So what happens is that you get a, um, so you're, this is, I'm plotting now the log of, uh, of uh, I'm plotting a log log plot where I have uh, everything in terms of this omega, this Fourier component of the signal. So I have some level of noise, which is this green, green line here. And then I have the decaying power spectrum of the natural signals, okay? So on the right of this, of this intersection point, my signal is much lower than my noise. So here I'm in low signal to noise ratio. On the left of this point, my signal is much higher than my noise, so I'm in high signal to noise ratio. So now if I take my formulas that I derived here, what I, what I find is that my, <clears throat> my C, my filter, will fall down to the right of this intersection point, also fall down to the left of this point. If now I make my signal smaller by turning down the ambient light or my nose noise bigger, this intersection point will move to the left. This red curve will become bigger and bigger. And at very light uh, dim background level or at very high noise levels, I'm ending up with this, uh, cur with this biggest curve here. So basically, as I change my noise or as I change my background light level, I'm moving from a band pass. Remember, these are the psi, so they're Fourier components of your filter, temporal Fourier components. So I'm moving from a band pass um, uh, filter to a low pass filter. And that's exactly what we saw before for the photoreceptors. So, What's re the reason I wanted to show you this is, um, okay, this is quite non-trivial, it's quite complicated, maybe you didn't catch all the details, you can go back to it, but let me summarize what happened. So what happened is that we took a very <clears throat> clear principle, which as Nick said, comes with some ad hoc choices of the form of the cost and so on, but the idea is clear. We're saying we want to maximize the mutual information at the cost of having a bigger range of outputs. And when I solve this constraint optimization problem, I find what the filter, the temporal filter in my photoreceptor should be and how it should change as a function of noise level or background light level, okay? So Van Hatteren did that and found all the numbers that you have in the fly, okay? And he could find all the numerical numbers except from one, okay? So there was one number he had to fit in his model. And here what you can see is the responses of a fly photoreceptor on the left. And on the right, what you see is the, res the, the responses predicted 
by this efficient coding model where you fit only one number. Okay, so if you don't like this, uh, your, your case is desperate because this, this, this is like a theory which is based, you, you just had this idea of efficient coding, you didn't fit anything, you just fitted one parameters and you get this set of curves that replicates exactly what's happening in the photoreceptor uh, response. So it's quite marvelous, I think, just as, a, as an intellectual exercise. Now, I'm going to spoil it a little bit for you by mentioning that this is, um, this is much, uh, uh, although it's so beautiful, it's quite incomplete because if you, because this is telling you, okay, at a given background light level or at a given level of noise, I will have one filter with one given shape, which you see here, and, uh, and it won't change. But this is actually not the case. The fly's photoreceptor is even more, uh, you know, smart than that. And here what you see are histograms. So these are histograms on the left of light intensity. So what Van Hatteren did, he stuck a camera on his forehead or some receptor of some sort and walked in the forest and then he retrieved uh, light series. And then he drew a histogram in each time bin of the light intensity that he had. And for different walks in different environments, he finds these different histograms. Then he showed this light series to a fly and he measured the photoreceptor response and drew a histogram of that, and then measured the downstream cell to the photoreceptor, the large monopolar, monopolar cell, okay? And what you see is that even though you have these funky histograms that come with different shapes, and some of them go up to 10, other ones go up to one and so on, you have a lot of compression happening, so much so that after two synapses, here in the large monopolar cell, you basically have Gaussian distributions that have the same extent. So it's a very nonlinear and pr probably dynamically adapting system that is adapting beyond the kind of adaptation predicted by efficient coding. Okay, so efficient coding won't solve the whole thing, but already gives some very strong predictions. So I see that I've covered about um, about half of what I wanted to say in the first 45 minutes, but the first 45 minutes are up. So let me just make some brief comment about the form of the theory. And then for the second half, you'll have to tell me if you want me to continue talking about efficient coding, but in population of neurons, or if you want me to switch to talk about correlations in neurons and complex tuning curves and so on. But let me just, before the break, let me just make one comment about this. So, to, to come back also, it relates to Nick's question. So <clears throat> here what we said is we want to write down a principle which is kind of a trade-off between two terms. And what we call the efficient coding was maximizing a free energy or minimizing this quantity where I just flipped the sign. So now I'm minimizing instead of maximizing. And what I want is to maximize this mutual information between input and output. So minimize minus the mutual information. But I also want to minimize the output range, okay? So it's interesting. I want to maximize the mutual information and minimize a quadratic quantity. There's a very similar theory um, that has been introduced in cognitive science and economics on which I'm, I've done a little bit of work, which is a very similar prescription, but the roles of the two things are inverted. So now instead of wanting to maximize a mutual information between input and output, you're going to say, I want the error between my input and output to be as small as possible, which is this term, okay? So you want to say that the response, I want to reproduce my input with my response, which is some function of the input. And I want this function to be as close to the input as possible, given the noise that I have. Of course, you can do that by making your noise as small as possible. And now you're going to say, okay, I I'm paying a cost, which is the cost of precision. So now my mutual information here becomes a cost. So it's basically the dual formulation from efficient coding, if you want. 
So you see, Nick, there, there's the problem that you're addressing is even bigger than you thought maybe, is that you can actually rewrite it in a completely different way. And this has shown to explain also some amount of phenomena. And there are several other formulations that are also, I mean, for those of you who are familiar with variational autoencoders, it's kind of related also. There's another principle, which namely the bottleneck principle, which now involves combining two mutual informations, but it's very similar ideas. You want to minimize one mutual information and maximize the other. They're not of the same quantity. So here you have an input S, an internal representation R, and an output capital S. And you want to, you want to minimize the amount of information that you keep from the input in your internal representation while maximizing the mutual information between your internal representation and whatever output you're supposed to give. So that's yet another kind of approach to these constrained uh, problems. So my point here is to say that however satisfying this efficient coding principle is, it can take a number of incarnation and there certainly isn't any consensus on uh, uh, you know, what, uh, what the, the, the correct formulations for the brain. You will have some authors that will pound you with papers trying to tell you that their formulation is the correct one, but you shouldn't believe them. So let's stop maybe for the break and, but yeah, I've talked too much and you haven't asked enough questions. So you should ask me questions. So any questions from the students for Rava before we take a break? Are you all ready to take a quiz? Rava will give you an exam or score you. Just kidding. Uh, any questions? Uh, anyone? Yeah, so I see there's one question. I th I'm not sure, Surpit, what you mean by um, delay. Oh, so, but I uh, so go ahead. Go ahead, ask. Show the response of the photoreceptor. You uh, show that with uh, increasing the noise, there is a short, like the delay to the response reduces, and then there are changes. Uh, yes, there is difference I in the number of peaks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will but show you. It, it does. I will show you. I will show you. Um, so here. So here. What's going on? So here, uh, if I increase my noise, I'm moving this. Hold on. Let me get my. my uh, let me get my. Sorry. Okay, if I increase the noise, it's like raising this green line, right? Alternatively, yes. I can increase my ambient light, my background light, that's like decreasing the noise. Sorry. Right. Now, as I, increase, as I decrease the noise, this intersection point is moving to the right. What you see is what you have in your filter is more and more high frequency and less low frequency. And so your filter will become faster. The delay will go down. Okay. And you can see this here also. If you look at this peak, so maybe it's not very clear, but I think you find that the delay goes to the left. You're right that here it doesn't look like that, but that I don't know why. I think it does go to the left. Okay. Uh, I had a doubt on this slide. Any other question? Okay, well, so, well, let's, uh, so Rava, shall we take a few minutes break? Yeah, yeah, let's take, and those who survive, I'll see you in 10 minutes. About 10 minutes, 10 minutes, that's two minutes after the next hour. Okay. All right, 10 minutes from now. See you. See you.
of my um, of my stimuli, then I will have to engage more neurons. So if I make the population twice as large, then I reduce the noise, and so I have to use more resources. So for a given amount of noise in one unit, I need more units or more spikes, for example, to reduce the noise in that abstract representation. So that's one way to think about it at a microscopic level. Yeah, so, helps. so should we start? So, uh, Xiaoqing, should I start? Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. I made a mess. So yes, why don't we start and uh, okay. I think all, all students are here. Okay, and again, uh, for students who, who are online, and if you can, uh, turn your camera so the instructor can see your face. Yes, yeah, so, it, um, so yeah. uh, stay on unless you, you know, Sorry, it's, not a, a, it's not a beauty contest. So yeah, yeah. we um, the uh, so so I I was planning to continue about I told you about half of what I wanted to say about efficient coding, and what I was going to say next about efficient coding um, uh, it was something a, a bit of a more modern view on efficient coding, which involves understanding how many cells we have in cortex that respond to one orientation versus another. But I think I will skip this, not to give you a indigestion of efficient coding and let me uh, share my screen and then move to another topic and if you want more on this uh, more on the efficient coding you can get in touch with me I'm happy to talk more about your let me skip all this actually will you um, also upload the slides to the uh website if you pay you know we have to negotiate it <laughs> i mean actually you will pay me starting from next month <laughs> that's right <laughs> okay so um so let let me let me now switch to a new type of uh, problems and ask how what is the role of correlations and what is the role of complexity in the tuning curves of neurons when you think about coding with a population of neurons so basically, to go back to my scheme, until now we said, okay, what, I'm, I'm assuming that I have some neurons that are encoding my stimulus, and this is this R, and until now we just thought about a single neuron. The example of the Van Hatteren example was a single neuron, a single photoreceptor, but, and we were saying, okay, maybe there is some resource limits on this R, and this resource limit will influence the way the stimulus is encoded. Now I want to expand the problem to go from one cell to a population of cells <clears throat> and ask what's the nature of this representation when I have a large population of cells. So the, the, the kind of setup I have in mind is suppose that I'm showing you different pictures. Here you have a picture of a spider, this will elicit some pattern of activity in your brain. Another bug here, this green bug, will elicit a different pattern of activity. If I repeat now this experiment many times, there will be the spider, because of the noise, will elicit a range of patterns that are near each other, whereas the other bug will uh, elicit a different set of patterns. But if there's an overlap, then there will be some ambiguity in the coding. Uh, but really, the, the, the identity of the stimulus is encoded now not only in the activity of a single neuron, but in the, in the nature of this pattern of activity. Um, the same goes if I, so this spider was an example of a discrete stimulus, but now I can think of a continuous stimulus. So for example, bars that are moving at different orientations. And the advantage of doing that is that we know some systems that are sensitive, some cells that are sensitive to these orientations. So you have direction selective cells like the one that is illustrated here. And this cell, you can see the responses here. This cell responds mostly to a motion in this diagonal direction, but doesn't respond to motion in other directions. So there's some kind of tuning curve where the cell responds preferentially to some angle of the bar and then less so if uh, you move away from this preferred angle. And when the bar is moving, it's covering the receptive field of many cells. And basically what we have is we have many cells that have these tuning curves that 
uh, are tuning curves for different angles. This S here is this angle. And when the bar is moving past them, each cell will respond more or less depending on what's the angle between, how does the angle of this moving bar in yellow compares to their preferred angle, okay? And so basically what the brain has to solve is the brain has these firing rate, these, fi these uh, responses, neural responses, and from that it can infer some angle of the, of the bar, and I've illustrated this in red. So from the pattern of activity, it will infer so some angle of the bar, and there will be an error because of the noise involved. So here I drew these responses without noise, but each of these responses will be contaminated with noise. And so there is now some error in the inference that is made because my representation is noisy, okay? And so there are a number of questions that we can ask. The first question I want to examine is how should I think of this population of neurons that is firing? Should I think of them as a bunch of soloists or more like an orchestra? Should I just look at the response of each one of them and kind of sum them up in some way? Or should I really take into account the details of the pattern that I have? And again, we can approach this on, on various levels. It's, of course, interesting to see what kind of patterns the, the, the circuitry can generate, but I will focus on more the algorithmic aspect of the problem. So, um, uh, just to, 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 to uh, kind of uh, be on the same page, what I will, the main quantity that I will kind of uh, worry about is the correlation between the activity of neurons. And by correlation, I mean the covariance, the appropriately normalized covariance between the activity of a neuron I and a neuron J, okay? And this quantity quite robustly is measured to be non-zero in the brain. In other words, neurons that are near each other, they fluctuate together to some extent. So if you measure this quantity in monkey MT, you find this kind of histogram. So the, the, the Y axis is the value of this quantity. The X axis is the number of pairs of neurons in which you measure this quantity. And what you find is that... Yeah. Is this between like next neighbors or so what is the distance? Right, so that's a good question. So the, all these measurements are kind of locally, I don't remember what, but let's say two microns away or something. So they're kind of overlapping cells with overlapping receptive fields, basically. Okay. So you're right that these will decay uh, with distance. That's also an interesting question, but these are all local cells. And so, and so let me just a few one thing. This is from MT. MT yes. has columns, so the yes. neurons activity is more correlated. But if you go to area, there's no columns, then then correlation is very low. So this probably holds in MT. Well, you have uh, the same it, thing in V1. Yeah. So, but the, the, so what what you have? Is, I mean, the correlations are low. You know, I'm not uh, I'm not saying that it's very mm -hmm. high, but on average, they're like ten percent, twenty percent. And uh, you know, we have measurements in the retina that I will show you, and it's comparable, maybe a bit bigger. But the main point I want to make here is that correlations are by and large positive, and on average, they're like 10, 20 percent. Okay, so if you have a neuron that is has some noise, then you have 10 percent of the other neurons that will have a similar noise in the same direction. It's firing too much or too little. They co-fluctuate, if you want. So is that good or bad for encoding of information? Like if I have these co-fluctuations among neurons, well. Simple arguments would suggest that it's bad. So imagine that I have two stimuli and I have a set of n neurons and each neuron can fire zero spike or one spike. And so, and suppose that each neuron is statistically the same. I'm kind of making the simplest possible model. Then any information is contained in the spike count of the population, okay? so. I have to count the number of spikes in this population, and then which is I call K, and then I have to decide whether I'm seeing the spider or the other insect or the insect. So there is some average firing for the spider, which is this K 
with the up arrow that I wrote here. There's some average firing with the with the insect. So if I show many many times the the the, the spider and then I I average the response in each case, I will get this value of k. If I show many times the bug, I will get this. But there will be some noise around it, just because each neuron has some probability of you know. The, the, the spiking is probabilistic. So I will not make mistakes as long as the distance between these two means, this quantity here, is much bigger than the width of these probability distributions. Okay. In other words, as long as the signal to noise ratio, which I can define as the ratio of the square distance between the two means and the variance of the mean is large. Okay. Now, for this simple system, it's very easy to, to calculate this quantity because the number, the average number of spikes will scale with n, okay? So the numerator will scale like with n squared. The variance now will scale with sigma, with, is just the sum of all the variances of each neuron if they're independent, but if they're correlated, I will have a cross term between neuron I and neuron J, and so I will also have a term which will be proportional to the correlation C. And so this ratio will scale like n squared in the numerator, and we'll have a terms that scales like n in the denominator, and a term that scales like n squared in the denominator. So if my correlation is positive, is non-zero, then when n goes to infinity, I saturate to a number. The signal to noise ratio doesn't become infinite. Whereas if the correlation is zero, then my signal to noise ratio grows indefinitely, actually linearly with n, okay? So what that means is that as I increase neurons, if they're independent, every time I have a new neuron, I have a little bit of information. But if my neurons are correlated, even if they're weakly correlated, even if the correlation is just 10%, at some point, adding one neuron is not giving me any further information because neurons are so correlated that if I know what every other neuron is doing, I will know what this neuron is doing. Okay. Any questions on this? So effectively, it's like the correlation kind of is decreasing the amount of information you can store in the system. Another way to think about it is if I have my two distributions, as I increase correlations, I make them broader. So I increase the overlap and the ambiguity. Okay. So is that really true? Is it really, is what happens in the brain uh, what is happening here. So of course you can ask the same question for continuous stimuli like these oriented bar. And I will, uh, in this case, you, again, you're, you're trying to, um, uh, what you want to do is to uh, estimate the angle of the bar based on the pattern of activity. And you can, you can quantify the accuracy of your, of your um, estimate by what I'll call precision, which is the inverse squared error. Okay, so if this precision is very large, it means that the error is very small. So I will not go through all the models that people have done and how they derive it, but let me tell you what they find. So the way the classical models go is, you will take a set of neurons that are uniformly distributed along this possible, in, in the stimulus space. So this neuron has a preferred direction that is here, this neuron is, responds mostly to bars that move at, an, at a vertical angle, zero. This neuron here has a preferred direction along this kind of near horizontal line and so on. And if you assume some form of correlation between these neurons, what you find is that instead of the precision growing indefinitely with N, as you have for independent neurons, then the, the precision saturates. So this is exactly the same idea as what we had before, namely that as I increase my number of neurons, at some point increasing neurons won't help me, won't bring me more information because they're all kind of all gelled because they're all so correlated. Okay, any questions? No questions. Any survivors? So um, 
So now let's see whether we, we, we wanted to see whether this is indeed what is happening in, in actual assemblies of neurons. And so we tested this in the so-called direction selective cells, not in cortex, but in the retina. And these are cells that have a preferred uh, firing. Now, the interesting thing about the retina is that they come in four types. So they are not uniformly distributed as in the cortex, <clears throat> but the cells have their preferred orientation along the cardinal directions. Okay, so there are four types of cells, and this is their um, mean firing rate is, are these nice smooth tuning curves, but there is noise around those tuning curves. And so this is kind of what single trial responses look like. Okay, so every gray dot is a single trial response. So you can see that the noise is kind of appreciable uh, around the mean response. So what we did is we just calculated this, the error that you would get if you decoded from a bunch of these cells. And we found that um, as you increase the number of cells, the decoding error goes down. So that's not very surprising because you know that the more neurons you have, the more information, so it couldn't go up. What's more surprising is what happens with the, uh, what's the role of correlations? So to quantify this, we define this quantity, which you call, um, you can call it improvement, but basically it's one minus the ratio of the error in the correlated case and in the independent case. So if, let's say, if the error in the correlated case is half of the error in the independent case, okay, then uh, this, thing will go like one over four. And so the improvement will be one minus one over four will be 0 0.75, will be 75%. Okay. So if, if right, and if um, the correlated, uh, you have zero error, then the improvement is 100%. If now the error is bigger for the correlated neurons than for independent neurons, the improvement is negative. Okay. So what you expect is, according to these classical arguments that we had before, here, for example, let me remind you, here you see that the correlated precision would, was lower than the independent, okay? So what you expect is that the independent system will have better precision, will have smaller error. And so you expect this quantity here that we define here to be negative. Well, what we found was the opposite. We found that it's positive. Not only is it positive, but we find that it grows with the number of cells. So the bigger system you have, the more helpful correlations. Okay. So it was kind of something that went against the kind of popular lore, if you want. So how, how can we explain this? So before trying to explain it, we said, okay, let's look at it a bit more in detail. And what you can see is that already for five or 10 cells, <clears throat> you have an effect that is not zero, it's appreciable. And so we said, okay, let's look at all the quadruplets. So all the four cells that have these preferred, preferred directions or all the octuplets and calculate their improvement uh, for each one of these small groups. And different colors here correspond to different experiments, different retinas and so on, but you can ignore this for now. What you find is that all these numbers are above zero. Okay, that's the mo that was the most surprising to me, which is that there is no single group of four cells for, or eight cells for which the improvement is negative. <coughs> In all cases, having correlation is helping you. So what, what's going on? Because that really goes against this intuition that we have that correlations uh, should, uh, should be harmful. So let's go back to the raw data and see what's going on. I think that's, um, that's the way to go and you don't know what's going on. So if you look at the raw data here, I'm plotting the and the spikes, the number of spikes in response to a moving bar for two cells that have preferred direction at right angle, like here. And different colors correspond to different uh, directions of motion of the bar, okay? 
And so what you can see is that you have noise, but it looks like this cloud of noise is elongated. And it looks like it's elongated in the perpendicular direction to the direction where you, that in which you move when you go from one stimulus to another. Okay, and that's the same for other directions. So this means that as I move my stimulus, my cloud of my noise is changing, if you want, my correlations are changing. And you see this, if you calculate the correlations between the different types of cells that you have, you find that you have these consistent shapes, these consistent modulations in the correlation, which are these lower curves that you see here. Okay. So if you, what happens now if you keep the correlations, but you destroy the structure? So if you now replace the correlation by just the mean correlation, okay, but you make it independent of the stimulus, okay? So this is what we, what we did here. So that's the results that you've already seen. So these results are the uh, coding improvement histogram for many groups of four cells. And what happens is if you keep correlations, but you make them flat, you make them stimulus independent, then you see that this histogram moves dramatically and the other one even worse. Now you have many negative quantities. So you have many examples of groups of cells for which the improvement is negative, meaning correlation is bad. So there is something in the structure of the correlation that is very helpful, okay? So here is an illustration of why this is the case. So imagine that I have these two cells that have now these, um, uh, these two tuning curves, and suppose that I'm moving in the, uh, the space of possible stimuli. So for example, in, in the red dashed bar corresponds to a moving bar at angle 90 degrees, the green is a moving bar at angle 120 degrees, the blue is a moving bar at angle 180 degrees. Well, the if I now draw the output of these two cells in a plane that is spanned by the output of cell one and cell two, I will go around some kind of uh, circular path like this, or somewhat circular path like this, okay, as I change my stimulus, okay? So what happens is that if I have uncorrelated noise, if there are no correlations, the clouds will be aligned, will have their principal axes parallel to the horizontal and vertical axes of the two cells because I have no correlation. And so as I move around this coding direction, these clouds will overlap a lot. If now I have correlations, on, you can look on the right, that now depends on the stimulus, these clouds can be both elongated, but they can also rotate together with the stimulus. And so that will prevent these clouds to overlap, okay? And so, these, so the idea here is that what's probably happening is that correlations are, are not decreasing the noise. You have just as much noise. If you project your noise on the x-axis or y-axis, you have the same variant. So each cell is just as noisy in the independent and in the correlated case, but the correlations kind of rearrange wh which direction the noise is in, in such a way that is helpful for coding as compared to the independent case. So that's the basic picture to have to keep in mind on, on this part of the talk. Any questions? So, hi. So Hi. just if I understood correctly, so it's somehow in some sense giving some context to the decision. If you have a stimulus dependent and correlations between neurons, it means maybe you have some context. You add some context to the decision. Uh, well, I think, I'm not sure what you mean by context, but I think what you could say is that as you change the stimulus, you're changing, so the stimulus is this one dimensional object, which is the angle of the bar, right? So you're moving, you're moving along this one dimensional stimulus. So in the space of firing of neurons, you're moving along a one dimensional line, okay? Now this line may curve and so on. And what 
would be helpful is that if you cannot get rid of the noise, if you still have noise, what you want is to actually organize this noise in a way which will not interfere with this line. For example, make it perpendicular to this line. And correlations can do that if they can depend on the stimulus. So uh, I'm not sure what you mean by context because what normally one thinks about when you talk about context is that you have the stimulus or let's say you have two stimuli and then the encoding of the first stimulus will depend on the presence of the second stimulus, which is not really the case here because um, it's, it's more kind of the geometry of the response to kind of this one dimensional stimulus or this stimulus that can vary along this line. I'm not sure my answer was very clear, but. I understand, <laughs> thanks, but I, I'm just, I understand your way of thinking about context, but I'm just trying to take it to the functional side, but mm -hmm. maybe we can consider context, context also as input of one neuron to the other. So I don't know, because I can see some, we can see some correlations and um, the response is depend on another neuron response. So at least for me, it looks like some kind of a context or some input from another place. Okay, okay, so that's, uh, yes, so maybe another way to say what you're saying is to say that if I look, uh, let's say if I look on the right diagram here, what I'm saying is that I can have a good coding if I give you the response of the two neurons at the same time. So I have to give you the coordinates of these points, both for cell one and cell two. But if I just give it to you from cell one and you have to make an inference and then I give it to you from cell two, you make an independent inference and then you average the two, you will get very wrong results. Okay, so if that's what you mean by context, which is that I have to take into account the full pattern, yes, that's for sure. Thanks. Any other question? Rory, you have a question? You, you kind of got closer to the screen, so I thought you have a question. Uh, no, I, I had, um, no, I, um, in the uh, Schnitzer group, we, we were doing a similar thing where um, we were studying uh, correlated noise and like making sure the noise was perpendicular to like the direction you were changing the uh, mm -hmm. stimulus in. So that's what I, um, when you guys were talking about that, that's when I was going to uh, interject, but I think you addressed um, the yeah. ideas that I was. So I was this is this, um, uh, this is this paper that this nature paper that uh, came out a few months ago of Marx. Uh, are you on that paper? Because that's where they make this argument. I see. I see. Uh, yes, actually, it's true. Although you, this argument in reality is a little bit more sophisticated than that. You can show that you don't actually need to be perpendicular, and uh, we're writing something on this. So if you're interested, I can tell you more. But Roughly speaking, it's that, yeah. Um, so let me, let's see what time we have. Let me skip um, what I wanted to say more about correlations and go to something uh, which is a bit different, but I find it entertaining. That was the main image that I wanted you to, you guys to get on correlations, I think I mentioned, but let me now uh, just spend 10, 15 minutes on a, a complementary topic, so to say, but rather than going more in details on correlations. So until now, we're kind of assuming that cells are very simple and that we're decoding directly from one layer of cells. So we're basically assuming that I have these cells that are in my retina and have these uh, smooth tuning curves and then I can just decode from these cells and tell you what the stimulus was, okay? Now, first of all, in the brain, cells don't have to be so simple, and I'll show you some of that. But also, in the brain, there are many layers of encoding. It's not like I decode from my retina and I make some action, but this, um, this information that comes from my retina kind of reverberates around the brain. Decoding happens somewhere, I don't know where and how but it's certainly not, you have more than one stage, so to say. And so I want, we, how, how, about, how should we think about this issue that you have more than one stage and you can have complex tuning curves? 
So what do I mean by complex tuning curves? Until now, we looked at these very simple kind of monomodal tuning curves that are like bell-shaped. But you have more complicated tuning curves uh, in the cortex. You have, for example, grid cells or place cells that are non-monotonic. So grid cells, for example, are periodic here. And if you think about them in the phase space of the activity of cells, uh, you get very different images. So this is the image that you should saw just before for two cells that have these bell-shaped curves. But if now I have two cells that um, are periodic, I get a very different image. Okay, and I get some, as I, as I change, as I tr uh, scan my stimulus here on the x-axis, and you can see the color coding for scanning the stimulus, I'm now covering the space of possible activity very differently. Okay, and so presumably I will have very different properties also for coding. So what can we say about this? And how should we think about this for um, when you have more than one stage of processing? And so one thing that you can think of doing, which is maybe the simplest thing is to say, okay, I will abandon the idea like here of having cells that are perfectly periodic, but let me imagine that I have some random fluctuations that are due or, or random sensitivity that is due to the fact that I propagate in a, in a network. And so this is a simple model that we're considering based on this idea. So imagine that you have this one dimensional input and you can read it off with many neurons, L neurons that each have a simple tuning curve, which is bell shaped. So, um, for example, if your input is X0, this cell here, which has the, the, that, that preferred X will spike the most, cells that are away will spike less and so on, okay? But now suppose that these cells are projecting to another, a second layer of cells, and that these projections are random, okay? Then this second layer of cells will have very complicated um, uh, uh, tuning curve responses to the stimulus. So for example, the green cell will respond with this value to X0, the other two cells would respond here. So if now I, I draw what happens, and suppose that I'm drawing this example for three cells here, basically this one-dimensional stimulus is, 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 is um, morphed into this kind of snake in this three-dimensional space, okay? And here, an, an important point is that I'm assuming that this N is much smaller than L. So I'm assuming that the second layer is much smaller, and you will see why. It's useful to assume that. So what you see here is that the shape of this snake depends on how narrow is my tuning in my first layer. So the, the more narrow I have, the more wiggly this snake will be, and the broader my tuning curves in the first layer, the broader the snake will be, okay? And so this gives rise to the same phenomena that you have in grid cells, which is that the errors are a bit different from a system where you have um, simple tuning curves. So imagine that my real stimulus is X0, and so the mean response would be here, where it's uh, labeled X0, but now I, I, my response is now contaminated by noise. So in one trial, maybe it's that response. In another trial, it's that response. So when it's this response, it's fine because my decoder will give me a value which is near X0. But if I have a, this response, this noisy response, then my decoder will think that it's coming from this stimulus because it's very close to the snake in this region, okay? And so I can have global errors in a system like this, whereas before when I just had simple tuning curves, I just had local errors. So kind of the, the nature of the error is a bit different. And, uh, and so we can ask, given this, how is, what kind of error will I get as a function of n? And the, 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 what the nice thing you can show is actually the error, even if n is quite small, uh, uh, can be very, very small. So, and let me unpack this kind of step by step. So, first of all, you can ask, what is 
the optimal width of my tuning curve so that I minimize the output error, the decoding error, okay? And that you can find that for any n, you can have some curve of the dependence of the error on sigma on the width of my tuning curve. And you find that there's a minimum that will depend on n. So for each n, you have an optimal width of the tuning curve, okay? And now you can say, for that optimal width, how does the error behave as a function of n? And what you find is that it falls down exponentially. So you have something very similar in grid cells that tell you you can encode information much, much more precisely with these kind of funky complex tuning curves than you would have with these simple bell-shaped tuning curves. So you have some kind of exponential compression of the information. Even though, even though this n is much smaller than l here, it still retains a lot of the information that is in the l layer. Okay. Um, well, let me interrupt quickly. Yeah, please. Um, how, did, how did you uh, initialize the random weights? I didn't uh, get it. Okay, so, so I, there's no learning here. There's yeah, no. Yeah, I, I just, just how you initialized it, yeah, I didn't okay, get it. So it, they're Gaussian here. And and oh, Gaussian okay. and okay. uncorrelated, yeah. Okay. So one can ask questions. For example, if you make them sparse or if you make them correlated, of course, it will change the, this thing. And these are all interesting questions uh, to ask, which we haven't asked yet. Okay. Um. Okay. So now this is true for um you when we use an optimal decoder. But in reality, one, of course, you never have an optimal decoder. You also have to decode with neurons. And if you assume that, this will give you even more constraints on what kind of decoding you can have. So I think, um, let, let me not spend too much time on this. Let me conclude because you had a long day and uh, I still want to make some points of conclusion. Then you should ask questions. So. Uh, I, I've, I've told you about half what I was planning, but I guess that's, that's fine. So let me make some conclusions. So <coughs> in this second part, we um, examine kind of what's the role of noise correlations for population coding and what's the role of the shape of the tuning function, which are kind of complementary question if you want. And we found that both of them can be very relevant for the ac accuracy of the code. In the case of noise correlation, we find that even if you have relatively small correlations, you can have a strong effect at the level of the population. That the effect is quite robust, so it doesn't depend so much on the details. I haven't described this in detail, but I mean, this is not a point I've, I've given you a lot about, but. Uh, you, you can show that. And another thing that I skipped over is that you may want sometimes to have, to organize your uh, cells along discrete preferred orientations to take advantage of the correlations, even if you have a continuous input. So correlations can basically really change the kind of algorithm that populations of neurons will use to encode information. From the mechanistic side, uh, there are various models, this I completely skipped over, but there are various models that you can think about as generating these correlations. You can think about common input and recurrent networks, and you can actually realize these networks and find mechanistically similar forms of correlations. Um, what we found by looking at uh, um, different shapes of tuning curves is that at the, at, the, at the cost of generating global errors, so that sometimes you have a little bit of noise that gives you a huge decoding error, if you allow for that, then you can have a very strong compression of the information and use many fewer neurons than you would otherwise to encode information quite, um, quite precisely. What I didn't describe for you in detail is that decoding then can uh, be a limiting factor and impose constraint on how much information you can encode. And also uh, you can ask questions about diversity, what the role of, of the diversity is, and you can show kind of very generically that it will help you. <clears throat>
So having tuning curves that are very different from one another generically is helpful. Okay, and the last point that I want to make, which is more um, in a sense mechanistic, is this is that we showed all these results for random feedforward network. So we didn't, didn't hardwire any structure. And so you could imagine that even in, in neural networks that are kind of not fine tuned or without kind of heavy learning, you could still have some compression of the information. Okay, so let me stop here more or less uh, on time. And uh, let's move to, ah, I should, I should mention that on this last part, on this uh, uh, feed-forward network, Simone, who's a student of mine, is has been working a lot on correlated coding. Uh, Felix Franke worked and Volker Pernis. I didn't manage to show you his work, which was more mechanistic, and data was collected by Michele Fischella in Boton Roska's lab. So I should definitely thank these people. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thanks, Saurav, for uh, Thank you. the lecture. So uh, let, let's have a, a questions. We, we have time for discussions. So. Yeah. so students who are... Questions, the two uh, comments, insults, whatever you wish. So, so, so just for you to know, for students, uh, there, this is two um, topic uh, Rava just covered, uh, population coding, and the efficient coding, these are two very important um, concepts that I'm glad um, and uh, Robert cover it because this is part of computation neuroscience that they heavily uh, used this kind of concept. But particular population coding um, has many applications and, uh, and, um, in the literature. So uh, why don't you guys say if you have any questions? So Wen Liang, I will ask you immediately. Somebody is asking me, how can I make such beautiful picture? I don't know which ones you're talking about. Some were in Python, others by hand. I'm sure you refer by, to the ones by hand. <laughs> yeah, Wen Liang, you have the question? Yeah, so thanks. So um, regarding the last part where you showed uh, this, the, essentially the smoothness of the tuning curve and how that affects decoding, right? You have right. a randomly connected intermediate layer. Um, so, uh, well, I guess first, um, have you tried to uh, investigate higher dimensional input space? Cause, because this is, I ask, I ask this because um, I know there were some results by Sanofsky yes. uh, on dimensionality of and the width, width of the Gaussian tuning curve. Um, and uh, uh, I guess also another question related is, um, Maybe, maybe you can answer the first. Uh, I'll think about how to answer the second question. <laughs> okay, so no, that's an excellent question. So let me give you, try to give you quickly two different kinds of answers. First of all, we did look at higher dimensional stimuli. So you could imagine that instead of having just X, you have X and Y, so you have a sheet. And now you have to yeah. like crumple a sheet in this higher dimensional space. And there, um, basically, now the model, you need to define it a bit better because you could imagine that you have single cells that are sensitive to one stimulus, one stimulus direction to the other or to both. So there's yeah. different models that you can um, define in that context. And we did some... Yeah, yeah. Oh. And we did, excuse me? You can carry on, sorry. Yeah, and we did, some, uh, we did some calculations on that. In particular, one reason was to look at some data of the monkey. So there are some experiments that the monkey is reaching different positions. So it's encoding different position and has to reach different positions in a cube, okay, different target positions. And what people found is that the encoding of the position of the hand uh, has these very irregular kind of preferences. These uh, neurons are not tuned in a very smooth way, but there's actually kind of fluctuate, like uh, um, uh, quenched fluctuations of the response of the neuron as you move your hand or as the monkey moves its hand. So there was an example. Sorry. Sorry. That's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So you had the three dimensional. So we did some analysis of those data. Um, now, Coming back to your other question, I think 
I don't have yet a good answer. I'm thinking about it because those early stuff of Sainovsky uh, and Zhang uh, were um, in the limit where you have an infinitely dense set of tuning curves, okay? So in that limit, it's, uh, you, you, ha you can derive a number of results and you find in need that in one dimension, you want them to be infinitely narrow. In two dimensions, I think it's irrelevant. In three dimensions and more, they have to be broad, something like this. But all that is in this limit where you have infinitely many neurons and that limit for me is not very well defined. So there is work that has been done later on uh, which kind of circumvents this, but circumvents it by saying, okay, now we're not going to minimize the error, but we're going to, the, the average error, but we're going to minimize something like uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, in, uh, the, I think was something like the average of the inverse Fisher information or the inverse of the average, something like this. So this would penalize differently the error and would prevent you from wanting uh, curves that are very, very narrow. Okay. Um, I think it was, uh, yes, I think what they did was to maximize, minimize, sorry, the mean of the inverse Fisher information or the mean of the inverse root of the Fisher information. So that penalizes very strongly for you regions where you would have very shallow tails of tuning curves. Because in those regions, if it's very, even if that region is very small in your stimulus space, you're, in, you're completely not encoding your stimulus in that region, so your error could be infinite. That's and then you're penalizing. So this result of Zhang and Sainovsky depends on this assumption of infinitely many neurons, and it's also depending on exactly what is your loss function. Right. And there are different results in the literature that uses different uh, assumptions, but there's no one paper where you can actually read and have a global picture. So that's something yeah. missing. If you want to write it, you should, you should write that paper. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah I think the uh, random, oh, sorry. So, sorry. The random no, connection, uh, what was the notion of the random connection there? Excuse me? What was the reason or the notion behind using random connections? Probably? So, no, no, it was only because I, you know, you, I was seeing these grid cells and people making argument about grid cells. And I was thinking, even though you can formulate all these arguments in the context of periodic cells, it, it's not intrinsically a result of periodicity. It's just a result of how you cover the space space. And so I just asked myself the question, if you have just random uh, tuning curves, can you cover the phase space just as well? And one way of creating random tuning curves is having a random network. So that was the motivation. Okay, thanks. Don't worry. Hello. Um, this this has to go when uh, when you were talking about grid cells. You showed that um, that path throughout the uh, phase space that had many self self intersections. Mm -hmm. And I, under, I understand that uh, um, the noise takes directions orthogonal to the path um, so that it, it makes less mistakes on um, like, you know, stimuli that are directly adjacent to um, stimuli you're at. But if you're close to one of those intersection points, it seems like it would want to make noise that was away from that intersection point so it wouldn't make a global error. Do you right. ever, yeah. you okay. ever see anything like that? Okay, so you're right. So, okay, so again, there are two elements. So one, one thing is that now you're thinking about the model, which is actually a bit more complicated than what I did, which is you're thinking about this kind of grid cells where you also have correlations. So in the case of these grid cells or these random networks, we looked at independent neurons. And you're absolutely right that these intersections are the source of those global errors. So you make very large errors, which you don't make if you have kind of a simple tuning curves and a sparser coverage of the phase space. Um, so the problem really was, and what I showed you is basically solutions to that. The problem really was is you want to stretch this line 
and kind of make it wiggly enough that you will use a lot of the face space available to make the local error small, but you don't want to do it so much that you'll start generating a lot of global errors. So in other words, the solution to this problem is really a trade-off between local and global errors, and that's the difference with the usual way of coding that people think about. And that's also what happens with grid cells. Only in grid cells, you know, you're just given grid cells with some periodicity and that's it. And you can just calculate the error. And this is what people like Ilafit and so on did. But here you, you have a parameter to change, which is this sigma. And you're asking, how should I change it to satisfy this trade-off? Any other questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, if I may. So, uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, Go so ahead. Are you aware of Kenneth Harris' recent work on this kind of? Uh, so he, he was arguing that the virtual system lies at the boundary where the um, the response property is not so smooth that it that can't tell apart. Uh, so basically, it's, it's, I think his my argument is that the smoothness has to be just right, such that it's. Um, you can know you can uh, the visual the visual system knows what's similar to what, but also still uh, unsmooth enough to be able to tell apart different stimuli. Um, Who's I think it's really Kenneth Harris? Uh, and oh oh think, yes, uh, yes, yeah, yes. So the, 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 he That's proved right. the theorem in a, in a neuroscience paper, right? So on that. So right. So your 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 this your your, your um, optimal sigma seems to. So you, the, basically the face, the, the three-dimensional thing you drew is actually quite similar to his argument, I guess. Well, uh, I guess for different things, but very similar no, in spirit. Right, no, it's an excellent question. I'm, I'm, it's, a, it's very nice that you saw. I was also thinking about this connection. Um, I, I have to think a bit more about. Um, he's not very, yeah, very, no, no. I have to okay. think a bit more about exactly what he's saying because there are several leaps in his papers that I'm not sure I understand very well. For example, he's showing a, a large number of photos, and mm -hmm. but he's claiming that these photos are uh, really representative of uh, this high-dimensional space which you have in the pictures, right? And so in the limit where you have infinitely many pictures, it's true. It's not completely obvious to me that it's true uh, when you have, say, a million or two million photos or however many he uses. So there are some, some parts of his argument. Also, he has very few trials and so on. So there are right. some parts of his arguments that I'm not sure I, I, I digested well. Having said that, I think essentially what he's saying is that if you take a high dimensional stimulus and you scan it, and now you draw the high dimensional object that you get in your space of neural firing, what you end up having is an object, if you calculate, it calculates its covariance matrix, those eigenvalue will span a huge range. They will, will have a power law behavior, and so you will have eigenvalues that are very small, eigenvalues that are very large, okay? And so I think that what it means, it's similar to saying that you have wiggles of different scales. You have very fine wiggles and you have very wide wiggles, okay? And so I think one could reproduce what he's saying, um, uh, yeah, I can that first, in a uh, simple in a simpler model than what he's doing, but kind of looking at superposition of different tuning curves. If you're interested in it, I'm happy to talk about it because it's something <laughs> I want to yeah. want to think about, anyways. Yeah. Oh, great, thanks. But there is definitely a connection. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yes, Nick. Yeah, uh, I just mentioned uh, when you just just mentioned about Ken Harris's uh, uh, work you mentioned. That. So you, um, I don't know uh, which which paper is referred specifically, but when people talk about correlation, other things you, you have to be clarified which layer of a cortex. Because in cortex, there are multiple layers, 
some of the data um, Rav showed, like MTV1, those come from upper layers. A lot of the data King Harris showed in his paper, that is some of the paper I remember, come from deep layers, layer four, five. That's because we hear record. And you cannot mix them. You have similar, there are four or five neurons doing biologically very different things than layer two, three. All the human weasels work are layer two, three. Okay. Layer four, five has a lot of neurons, a lot of oscillations, and particularly in rodents. But they make different things. So when you talk about correlation, you know, all of that stuff, you have to specify which part of the data in cortex you talk about. Okay. I see. Because it's different. Lam laminar are not uniform. But this is one of a kind of a fundamental knowledge that we have talked about perhaps in the future workshop. We'll kind of talk about it in supplement to computation. Because a neuron in cortex, it depends which area, which layer, is different. It's not always the same. Yeah. 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 I, think it's a, I think it's a good thing to, to point out and usually yeah. hear it, so usually I ignore. <laughs> Actually, Nick, if you don't mind me making a comment on this, uh, and then I'll. I'll um, the, the interesting thing is that indeed, I, one thing which is true is that in theory, in the theorist work, theorists often analyze like recordings of neurons that are just randomly sampled. May, even in a given layer, they're randomly sampled, and you can ask the question: Well if I sample my neurons, you know, according to some given type of neuron or some neuron that, you know, uh, get input from the same neuron and so on, will I get the same characteristics, the same statistics of the activity? And this is not yet known. We're analyzing now some data that suggests that it's not the case. And so if you select your neurons because they're part of the circuit in some way and you look at the statistics of the activity, it kind of doesn't look like the statistics that most people will report for randomly selected neurons. So this is very true. Um, what what Shaoqin was saying is even more general, I think, because it's like saying in retina, you know, you would, now we know exactly the circuit of the retina. We know which cell types there are and so on. And so if you select, you know, ganglion cells of a certain type or amacrine cells of a certain type and look at their statistics of activity, you get very different results than if you just pick ganglion cells at random. And I think that, you know, in the cortex, we will get to a picture that will also be much more refined than what we have now, which is basically just treating every cell uh, like they're, they're from the same group in, the, in all these models. So Nick, right. please. So Yes, that's a good point that I think for uh, Fairwrong Experiment because in the experimental side, uh, um, research now have come to sort out the cell types now in cortex, you know, laminar. Basically in the cortex, right, you, you have X, Y dimension, that's different cortical areas, V1, V2, V3, so first one. And then vertically you have laminar. Now, even within laminar, there are different cell types. So experimentally, that has been taken part in further. So eventually computation will catch up, model all of them. It's like you have a, you know, you have your cell phone, you open up, you have circuits, you have a chip, right? They have a transistor, resistor, capacitors, all of that. So right now in terms of computational models, you know, like the graphic models, uh, Karina, Kurt talked about the day before, right? It's all, you know, generic dots of neurons. But eventually you have those models with Dots, circles with different color represent different type of neurons, right? You eventually have a move that way when you talk about dynamics. So, so that's the direction I think as a competition model will go as experiments <laughs> provide more and more details for you to model. Yeah. Any, any other questions? You know, population coding, uh, Rob just covered, is extremely important, extremely important for experiment to guide the experiment to interpret data. Yeah. Because think, once you go into cortex, there's no evidence of grandmother. So, you know, face patches as, as, um, as extreme as uh, people would have found. But even that, uh, you know, if you follow up with face patch literature, there are a lot of cracks. And there are five patches in monkeys, right? And now people is, begin to actually, some people begin to argue. So-called face neurons are not really for face per se. They're just part of complex object coding. Mm. So all of this eventually comes down to publishing the brain in the brain. 
you know, Intel Core is. Uh, Nick, you have a question, I think. Um, thank you, Reva. Uh, thank you for an extremely interesting talk that I'm going to need to read over and try to digest um, at a slower pace, I think, because I don't think I absorbed all of the second half. But um, if you will allow me just to ask one more time about the question about um, how one represents costs. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if, um, in the case of photoreceptors, I think what I was thinking initially was that the R stood for some kind of firing rate. But um, am I right in saying that for the photoreceptors, actually the, the R would be something more like a, a membrane potential? Exactly. A voltage. Yes. Um, so maybe it does, maybe perhaps it's then easier to see why a deviation from the resting potential is, is, is the cost, because that implies some kind of pumping cost. The cell has to, the cell has to make good over the long run. Um, so maybe it's less mysterious than I thought it was initially. Yes, absolutely. You're absolutely right. I should have mentioned this, and I, I'm sorry I didn't, is that in the retina, except for ganglion cells and some amacrine cells, the other cells are all analog cells. And so they're releasing uh, uh, all the time and they're not spiking. And so indeed, the photoreceptors are actually releasing uh, um, uh, neurotransmitters uh, continuously and actually when they um, when they respond to light they release less mm. uh, and so yeah so so it's completely different way of signaling than with spikes so that that's a very good point yeah I should have mentioned it yeah thanks very but, much it's but more generally obvious. more generally these questions about costs I think and how to choose the costs and how to formulate your trade-offs and so on are very important and I suspect will become more central as we go because especially like uh, Xiaoqin is saying when you go into the brain you know when you're in the retina maybe you have some idea of what the retina should do and so on but uh, but uh, when you um, uh, when you um, when you go in the brain you have there's very little kind of guide that you have for what the brain is doing. And so I think those more general principles where you trade off some cost with some performance will become more and more important. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, there's probably no more question. I think just the mere fact of surviving these lectures is uh, a feat of yours. So, um, uh, Xiaoqin, you're muted. As I was asking students whether you are surviving, this is day five. We, we've uh, fed you too many, I hope not too many materials. Um, there's a lot of materials um, as going through, so it's okay if you don't, um, don't get everything. And I was talking to a student last night and I jumped in uh, uh, when the discussion. Some student I was talking about will ask feedback about all the details. You know, as organizers, we feel it's okay. You don't understand all the equations, all the details. But what's important for you to walk away from this summer school is a feeling. What is the computational neuroscience, and how that is applied to problems? Right. And perhaps for some of you graduate students or postdocs, this might be give you some idea which direction of research you may want to pursue. Right. And you know, a year from now, ten years from now, you're not going to remember every formula we talk about. It. But I hope for this discussion for various subjects that are from instructors in Kunarava today will give you a test impression. What is it like? Right? Hope, hope for that will stay in your head for years to come. And I will have a chance um, at the end of uh, summer school, the roundup discussion. I hope all of you will make effort to attend to discuss your feedback and suggestions for the future improvement. So um, just hang on there. You have two more days. Um, <laughs> two more days. I think most of the students uh, here are from uh, America and the uh, US and uh, Europe. Yeah. Around this uh, this um, session. Yeah. Marina, you're sweating because of my lecture. I'm switching. What? Are you sweating because of my lecture? <laughs> <laughs>
No, oh, it's so warm. I don't have air conditioning. <laughs> oh. And when I put my uh, fan, then my hair looks like I'm crazy. <laughs> no, but so where are you? Where are you? Luke also sweating, so I guess. Marina is in Basel. Oh, oh, oh in Basel. It's hot there? It's really it's hot? Yes. Oh, okay. Very, very. Yeah, yeah, it's it's getting... very. It's hot in Paris also, but I, I love it, so it doesn't affect me. Any other questions for students before we finish? Well, let's all thank uh, Rav again um, uh, for his so uh, last thank minute. Thank you very so much for being here. Thank you very much. Um, uh, okay, so let's see you. We'll see each other tomorrow. Thank you so much. We'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. Xiao Qin, let's yeah. talk for a few minutes, maybe. Yes. Yeah, let a uh, student can sign up for now. See you tomorrow. Uh, two students still here. Are you still online or? <laughs> or I'll that's ask our you to leave. that's our daily test for intruded for you know uh, yeah.